And just like that, we are back in the studio. And uh, once again, my name is Jesse Hall. This is Business Elite Brevard Edition. And if you're on Facebook presently, please go ahead and leave uh, comments, questions, because for the next hour, we're going to have a really fun, uh, supercharged uh, conversation with the one and only Frank DeBello from Space Florida. Now, Space Florida, of course, if you haven't known, is one of the biggest cheerleaders of organizations that we have. Uh, we have seen all kinds of progress come through this organization, and we're going to take, a, again, a deep dive with the president and CEO today, Frank. Uh, but before, again, we get into that conversation, I want to remind you to uh, give this a share, give us a like, pass it on, because you're not going to want to miss anything that we're going to be sharing for the next hour. So uh, welcome to Space Coast Podcast Studios. How happy are you, Frank? To, happy to be here. Really. Oh, man, you, you, you sound terrific. And thank you so much for spending your Monday morning with us here. Now, if people don't really know you yet, and I could go along and read a very impressive bio, what accomplishment do you think that you may be known for? Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. The, probably the thing I'm most proud of mm -hmm. is something that I did midway through my career when I got active with the USO in, oh. in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to school, especially university, during the Vietnam War era. Oh, wow. And all of my buddies were going into the war after, after graduation. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of what I had studied, I went to Washington, D.C. and did defense work for a few years. Uh, and so with that deferment, uh, I clearly uh, uh, was exempt from, from military service, mm -hmm. but always had a respect for the military, always right. had a uh, respect for those guys that went over to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a chance for me to do something good for them. So for, uh, for almost a 12-year period, I uh, took a lead position with the USO mm -hmm. uh, as a volunteer, wow. but was chair of their board very quickly, helped them rebuild their funding base, recatalyze their programs to change from an era where they were doing coffee and donuts and dances right. on Friday nights to one where they were really serving military families. And uh, we, by the end of that time, had gone from a, a budget that was just under $100,000 to mm. three to five million. Uh, wow. And it really did very, very well. A lot of uh, community support, industry support. We broadened the reach, and we certainly modernized the uh, information and referral and other kinds of services they were providing to military families. And mm. that was an accomplishment I'm very proud of. Sounds uh, in incredible. Mm -hmm. I know the work that the USO has done over the years. Um, the, again, it's it's a very um, thankless kind of job. You know, a lot of people don't really recognize the work, um, but it sounds like you, you got them into shape and, and, and modernized them. And that was just out of, of course, being a volunteer must be, have been out of the heart or just out of deep respect. Well, it was a, it was a combination of things. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, I had a, a civic and social responsibility oh. with the firm that I was in mm -hmm. at the time, which was KPMG or Pete Marwick, very large. Mm -hmm public accounting firm, uh, and I had responsibility for their civic and social budget. So you had to lead by example. That was clearly something that I could do that was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a thing that I believed in. Right. Uh, I think uh, we don't do enough for our, uh, for our vets and for our active service members uh, and their families, especially during that time. We were right. transitioning from a, a, a an enlisted, or I'm sorry, a, a drafted force to an all-volunteer force, and so uh, the a lot of the infrastructure to support military families in an all-volunteer force wasn't there. Gotcha. So it's, it's something, something really a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like an incredible outreach project, you know, uh, from KPMG. Uh, before we go into more of your career, let's give a little bit of uh, background for, for our audience sure. who hasn't uh, been familiar with, with Frank. So, Frank, where'd you uh, grow up? What was your upbringing like? I was uh, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. Okay, a large Italian Catholic, yeah, uh, family city kid. Uh, yeah. I had three brothers, two sisters. Uh, my father was a pharmaceutical chemist, and my mom, oh, wow. my mom taught uh, music. Uh, and she had graduated. She was one of two of nine children that went to 
uh, she's one of two of the nine children that mm. uh, her family uh, encompassed. But the, the, she, she, those two went to college. Oh, I see. So it was a it was a time when uh, not everybody went to college. Was changed. That's absolutely right. right. So I was very fortunate uh, mm. in uh, in the city. You uh, uh, you get by by being up uh, games on the street. And mm-hmm. <laughs> got into basketball. A lot of pickup basketball it was a lot of fun. Excellent. Uh, but it was a, a city living. So that you become city sensitive. Well, you get street smarts real quick. You do get street smarts. Yeah. Real quick. And then you grew up in, into your teen years, I guess, right around Vietnam? Uh, just about that, yes. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I found is uh, that, that uh, as we uh, grew, as the kids grew, we mm-hmm. moved from the city to the suburbs, as many families did at that time. Gotcha. And so I uh, went from being active, doing things that were uh, more local in a neighborhood to mm-hmm. spreading out a lot more. Still very interested in basketball and <laughs> and sports in the suburbs. You could play a lot more uh, actively. Yeah. Well, there's a park sports. around every corner, right? That's exactly right. You know, in the urban setting, it's uh, it's you know maybe the local YMCA that's shared through you know three different uh, neighborhoods. Well, and there were it's, there were parks, there were athletic facilities everywhere. Right. So I went to high school uh, mm-hmm. in the suburbs, uh, ran track and cross country. Oh wow! Then uh, went to Villanova. Uh, very good, my, uh, very nice school. Group, yeah, yeah. But, but again, a good big basketball school and yeah, well known for track and cross country, which I did try. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, in contrast to the really, really excellent world class runners they had, right? Um, I was a dreamer. So Frank, so. Frank, <laughs> you you weren't on the, st- the starting line, huh? Um, how about this? So you went to Villanova on a scholarship, I presume? No, no, no? I I was. Uh, uh, part of a class of, I majored in mathematics. Okay. And there were 39 of us that started wow. and, and 11 graduated. So I no kidding. really uh, and was happy to graduate. Let's so, put it that way. So what was, what was your degree called? Just degree in mathematics? It was a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. Okay. I had a, a an equivalent in philosophy. Oh, I see. Which I was very interested in also. And the two go mm-hmm. together. How uh, so? I think one asks the question why, and the other mm. really attempts to get to answers. But both have an analytical approach that trains the mind to think. Right. So it was a, it was really a nice blend of of uh, study discipline and mm-hmm. mental mental discipline that was required. Well, you know, you got to exercise those brain muscles, right? You do. And uh, and being analytic and being able to look at something, especially through a couple different lenses: a philosophy lens, a mathematical, mm-hmm. you know, scientific lens. It gives you perspective that most other people you're working with maybe don't, and that's what's unique about having a team. Everybody has a different lens that they're looking through, from you know their perspective, uh, their background, their training, their skill set, and and I think that's what makes things work. You know, is more than just one person. I I agree, and I was mm-hmm. also blessed. I think I was surrounded by uh, relatives and and friends who drove you to ask the next question the the, the second question the third question uh good you need you, you need did, you didn't just accept a first answer you wanted to know why that happened right or what what the underlying reason for something was and that helps you tremendously in your whatever mm-hmm. career path you pursue were you an inquisitive kid were you the guy asking all the questions in class I don't know that I was so outward in class as much as my mind clearly was asking these gotcha. questions. All right. And I eventually did dig, 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 dig for the answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Villanova, tell us more about that career. How how'd you, how'd you like college life? I loved it. Yeah. Uh, I was a day hop, not a resident. Okay. That part of life I missed out on. But at that time, that, that fit. Uh, I had to, in, in the main, I split college costs with my parents, so mm-hmm. that was important. So I always had two jobs at least wow. going through school. Uh, That's not that, easy. That was, no, it wasn't, but it was also fun. There's another aspect to learning about life that comes from being out there in the workforce at any age that it, you, you don't especially. necessarily get from school. Right. Um, I think by the time I, I graduated high school, I had probably three or four jobs, mm-hmm. multiple interviews, multiple resumes being made. I knew more about getting a job before high school <laughs> than, than I remembered and that, you know, that I recalled from my studies. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, a little combination of some urban street life combined with some real world experience while you're 
in school, you know, all, all of these adding to just your worldly knowledge. And, and you, you and just can't be a, a bookworm. It, right? it's, it, it builds a self-confidence that mm-hmm. it's hard to, uh, to describe. Once you know you can fend for yourself, you know, make a dollar in mm-hmm. a day, you know, be able to uh, show that you have the skill set, you know, get the job, get in front of the right people, nail the interview and start earning something all in your own accord. It's, it's huge. And especially if you, if you do it towards something that you are really passionate about, right. You know, so it, it seems like throughout your career, you've kind of went more and more to the exploration uh, part, the curious part of yourself. And, and you, you seem to have, um, landed from KPMG days now in a world that it it's changing every day. You know, we we just started seeing more footage from Mars recently. Yes. So how 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 did you get into KPMG and was that your first job? No, when I graduated from Villanova, I mm-hmm. had a degree in math, and again, it was in the height of uh, the Vietnam War. Okay. Uh, but with my uh, degree, I connected with a group. Mm. Uh, I actually wanted to be a pilot, and so I tried oh, you did? to get did into you? the Air Force and oh, okay. also the Navy to uh, <clears throat> go to flight school. Wait, they can't? They couldn't have both denied you? Well, they did. Uh, they oh. didn't deny. Okay, uh, but my eyes weren't good enough to be a pilot for the. <sighs> Isn't that so frustrating? For the Navy <laughs> and the uh, Air Force wanted right. to put me behind a Beaumont console somewhere in Montana, yeah. which wasn't thrilling. That's uh, not thrilling. But I had this offer in Washington D.C., mm-hmm. which was a Buck Rogers kind of job. Oh, uh, tell us. That's another Flash Gordon type of name. Yeah, no, uh, I get it. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, But it was to go into Washington doing uh, work for the Pentagon, Mm -hmm. uh, doing operations research studies, helping the Pentagon optimize uh, decision-making around procurements or next-generation weapon systems. Wow. That was your first Uh, job. The first job. (laughs) Okay. For for five years, I did those kinds of analytical studies. And I might have been a step and fetch it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I I can't say I was project lead on those. But I sure learned a lot, and uh, after five years, was recruited into uh, what was then Pete Morick Mitchell, a mm. public accounting firm, and one of the largest in the world at the time. Their goal was to build a stronger defense and uh, uh, aerospace practice. I knew something about it, so I fit into the group. You got a dream position right away. It, it was a dream position, mm-hmm. but in many respects, I was also a misfit uh, oh. as a math major in a public accounting firm, mm-hmm. and uh, they they weren't quite sure what to do with me, so mm-hmm. they let me run free, oh. and that's where I think I did best, uh, when I had the ability to think about something, spot an opportunity, mm-hmm. uh, and if it made sense, go after it, uh, and I was able to do that. I became... A partner very quickly wow. in in Pete Marwick, and I spent the next twenty four years there managing their aerospace industry practice, helping companies either grow internally through market growth mm-hmm. or uh, in developing strategies to do that, or helping them grow externally through merger and acquisitions. So I did a lot of M and A work during that time. And and so a, a kid from Philly playing basketball in the streets. You know, this is like the Fresh Prince, you know, <laughs> it's theme. A little, it's a little like that story. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Except that I was a scrawny little kid with, right. uh, with <laughs> scraped knees a lot. Oh, man. So uh, and now you're head of acquisitions for aerospace. You know, it's a, it's a different world. It's, uh, yeah. We don't really do uh, acquisitions as much as uh, attraction. How, just so I could figure out the timeline, what are sure. you, like 23, 24 right now? Uh, while, while you're there, when I was uh, I was uh, 26 when I left. Wow. When I left um, the uh, the defense work and uh, joined Pete Marwick. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, r- right at 21 into a it seems like a really fun position with tons of liberty, tons right. of just um, carte blanche, and now you get with this accounting firm, and you spent 24 years helping them with the aerospace. That, uh, that's department. right. Yeah. And we grew the practice. It was quite successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they achieved their objective. Uh, and I had fun 
if I really saw something new that was out there, an right. area we should pursue, the, I had pretty free reign. The firm became KPMG mm -hmm. through acquisitions of its own. Gotcha. Um, and I saw that uh, space was increasingly becoming part of the, mm -hmm. the world of interest. So I started a space practice for them. And that's what got me into the space world. And that space practice, after learning about your very illustrious <laughs> accomplishments, that led you to helping and fund and find funds for the International Space Station, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it, it, it supported a number of companies mm -hmm. that were uh, pursuing work with the station. Oh, I see. But uh, basically what we were doing was taking satellites mm -hmm. to Wall Street for finance right. and packaging the, the deal. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, uh, in those early days, if you brought something to Wall Street and said you needed $300 million for something that you're going to put on top of a rocket that could blow up, <laughs> right. uh, that was not thrilling to most Wall Street investment houses. No, no. So, they don't want to see things go up in smoke. So there was an art form associated with covering risk. Right. And that's what we learned to do. It became a very successful practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and related to station we did a lot of that for private commercial companies but related to station i did win a contract with nasa that was a five-year contract to develop commercial uses mm -hmm. of the space station to help attract industry right to see the opportunities to uh, exploit some attribute of space for commercial purposes well, why not? You know, you're in a, a low orbit, as they call it, and uh, and with those things include a lack of gravity, which <laughs> we kind of that, need. That's a big one, right? And there's there's also the high upness of it; it's mm -hmm. way up there. Oh yeah. Uh, so you get vantage point. There's a zero gravity, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's a vacuum of space that can be exploited. Uh, wow. There's a, a radiation environment that you're in that can be exploited. Right. All of those attributes are are valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, can have some commercial value if you learn to properly do research or to manufacture under new methods or to think about mm -hmm. uh, using the vantage point for well yourself for being a useful product yeah yourself being uh, somebody who's curious you know I I could think of a handful of fun things to do up in you know low, low orbit you know with with very little gravity you know we, we've seen how they eat food and br mm -hmm. brush their teeth i mean these are just day-to-day -day stuff you know but you know what's it look like to prepare any, you know anything any kind of uh recipe up there or or even uh grow a plant grow, um you know how does plant or organic matter age you know is it the same as, as Absolutely. down here on earth there's so many questions. And how much radiation, you know, are you getting, you know, by leaving the atmosphere? Because it's nothing between you and the sun, you know. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there, there are some precautions, um, radiation-specific um, medicines and everything else, you know, you may need. Because these there's guys who have been up there for, for years, you know. Um, that's a long time to be exposed to these things, you know. So I think uh, the astronauts are their own experiment. You know, and, and seeing and how, how the body performs. They, they are, and to NASA's credit mm -hmm. and to the other space agencies around the world that collaborate, we've used the, the things that we've learned from the earliest days of going up there, mm -hmm. whether it was for an orbital flight or spending time on the station. Uh, we've used those to develop insights into the impact on our human bodies, right. uh, how to build spacecraft that can shield uh, from uh, the risks associated with being up there. But right. we've also learned a lot about the things you mentioned, uh, the impact that uh, a change in environment can have on plant growth mm. so that we can better grow things here on the ground. We uh, use Earth observation data to learn a lot about uh, the crops that are on the ground, where they're diseased, and to more efficiently target application of um, nutrients or water or whatever it may be. Uh, there's so many things right. that we are preparing for as we seek to go out further into space. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. Well, we got to put a human, I suppose, in orbit for, what, like seven months? Supposedly, you know, mm -hmm. they, they go into some kind of um, uh, coma, uh, med med medical-induced coma, 
for like seven months so they're not like burning calories and they don't need to eat or anything else i remember they just re- must have been like 10 years ago they were asking for volunteers to spend up to like three months asleep like in like you know you're, you can't get up you have to be in a, a chamber and that's where you live and you're fed through an umbilical and everything else is is just taking care of for you and um i, don't, I remember they were ask, asking like for fifty thousand dollars or something for somebody to do that but it just seemed like whatever the measure just seemed like too great of a a risk for for the reward you know it just it, it, it didn't seem to compute but uh but i'm sure there were some volunteers who did it just to be curious you know i mean i'm i'm wondering what that first uh space flight to mars on on you know the humans i mean where are they going to come back um and tell us you know what are the findings going to be you know it's, i think that's that's going to be the those those questions that just keep us yearning and keeping the aerospace industry active right so well that's the beauty of uh, the accomplishment that nasa just uh, mm-hmm. achieved uh with landing perseverance on yes. mars huge uh, they're, they're going to learn a lot more yeah. right uh, we know a lot but we're learning a lot more about the environment there mm-hmm. um, what kind of conditions we will face when we do send men there right Excuse me. No, you're you're good, Frank. And 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 to go on that point a little bit further now with perseverance, we're seeing 4K. I mean, the resolution these images mm-hmm. you know are come back to for, and and fra- rather quickly. You know, so now we have better communications. You know, before message used to take a day or whatever whatever you know lag uh, time lag there was, and now we're getting things in like you know 12, 13 minutes. You know, it's it's really really um, just just it's almost like it's right right there with us and it's like 17 million miles away or something ridiculous right and it will continue to improve we'll mm-hmm. learn a lot more and uh, we'll develop the uh, technologies necessary to keep humans alive for right. long duration space flight uh, clearly we have to protect them from radiation we need to find ways to carry or or generate the nutrients they need for long duration space flight once they're there mm-hmm. it's the same a set of uh, challenges to keep them alive. We can pre-position hmm. assets, which is a big part of the planning that's going on. Right. So you'll send food, fuel, habitat, and other things like that out there in advance, so that uh, when they that, that the room is ready when they arrive. So it's it's reminiscent of some of the sci-fi, and the sci-fi that's coming out is so much more predicting. Mm-hmm. I should say it's not like fantasy with like dro- droids and laser beams and you know it's more of uh w- what would it look like you know and who is going to come and are we going to you know is it going to be industry first you know mining and seeing if there's any possibilities of, of commercial use or are we going to start, start send uh you know a big biological team just strictly to do you know research and 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 scientific uh study and and, and similar things like the iss has done uh but you know i'm sure that industry has found a lot of different uses for ISS and I'm sure they can't wait to see what you know how their products or you know it could be a pharmaceutical you know how does aspirin you know uh, does it age well in space you know I mean or, or will it make sense to send um, earthly medicines to that atmosphere or will it contaminate or so, I mean you don't know how these things are going to react so there's there's a lot of question marks I, well, I think there are, but we are learning a lot, and right. I, I, uh, I know that uh, as we um, send mm-hmm. those first forays, uh, which are probably going to be mostly scientists, right? Uh, out, commercial industry is going to follow shortly behind. Right. It's just the neat, excuse me, the way the yeah. uh, the nature of things work. Um, well, commercial some companies are already figuring out ways right. to exploit. Uh, asteroids, or uh, I've seen that uh, to put colonies on the moon. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to actually extract value from. Uh, so let's that we know or exist there. Let's talk business. Let's pretend there's a angel investor out there, and 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 they got hundred million to just get in bed with somebody doing some mm-hmm. something terrific. You know, we have uh, of course SpaceX doing wonderful things. Uh, it seems like Blue Origin is still kind of ramping up. You know. Uh, waiting to see what happens with them. OneWeb is another one, you know. So we have look, we look here just here on the Space Coast, and we see all of these contractors. Like I'm sure they're all chomping at the bit to get that 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 contract, and you know, send a delegate, ideally somebody with their interests, you know. So not that these astronauts going up are exploitable. I'm sure they have their own, you know, mission 
and uh, and they're not really going to try to accomplish an agenda. But you you you, you want to you want to admit that I would love to take a private industry's money and say you know you know yeah you know there is somebody on the team with some of your interests at mind. You know you're gonna you're gonna have your own proprietary uh, research that that's not going to be shared with anybody else, and then you will retrieve it and you'll bring it back. You know, and then we're gonna and then that allows that industry to figure out how. Uh, what what applications may be something um, of potential there right so I I think and I think I don't think that's a bad thing I I think with you know some of these companies who have already made the investment into the moon into Mm -hmm. the ISS these are again thankless positions like there's no as far as we can see we're not mining the moon the moon hasn't granted us like huge abundance of materials or minerals or wealth or anything else like that right it was just it was just for the sake of going well there's some of that but Mm. typically investment capital follows markets right so it's market that drives the investment and the first major area of exploitation Mm. using space has been the fact that we could put communication satellites up there right or earth observation satellites that take pictures whether the buyer is Google Earth or whether it's you looking for a, a different shot of your neighbor's backyard. There's right. lots, of, <laughs> lots of things you can Certainly. You can, you can do because the the data, the bits of information have value. Right. And that, that sector of the space economy has mm-hmm. been growing rapidly. And then another driver for it is the fact that we have collectively an insatiable demand for bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And the space network of satellites have become increasingly a part of our global telecommunications network mm-hmm. and a vital one. So as that happens, uh, more and more satellites will go up. What's uh, critical, I think, mm-hmm. is that we protect those assets, right. uh, and that's what Space Force will be doing. But they they generate a lot of revenue, and mm-hmm. they're going to produce a lot of companies on the ground that are taking all that data and right. making value out of it for our everyday lives. So is Space Force more to protect satellites, protect in intellectual property, or is it um, to protect more of the assets on, on the land, you know, like, like uh, the, the launch pads? I, I think it's all of the above. Uh-huh. Uh, there are physical threats to the assets we have on orbit. Okay. And those assets on orbit need to be defended. Right. Uh, the assets on orbit also project uh, certain in information and insights to forces on the ground mm. uh, who operate more effectively and are dependent on them. So right. there's that connection. Uh, but the space network is increasingly part of our global transportation network, mm. our power grids, our right. banking and finance system. Yeah. So if a less than friendly actor wants to take out some of those assets, hmm. we need to be able to replenish them quickly and right. also defend them. And that's what Space Force will be doing. I'm well, so, actually I'm so, it's combatant commands. Will yeah, be I'm really I'm really excited about it. And, it, and lucky for us, we were one of the fi- uh, I think five finalists. Correct me if I'm wrong. Where we were, fi- but Patrick Air Force Base was considered as headquarters. It was it was considered as one of, of actually six finalists. Six, okay, six for uh, the location right. of these the combatant command headquarters. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they were not selected as uh, as the finalist. Gotcha. So who do you, who you think's going to win? It's going to go to uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Really? I thought I thought Colorado had it in the bag. Well, Colorado may have thought they had it in the bag <laughs> as well. Um, but, and there will be a lot of uh, Space Force mission elements that are in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Certainly there'll be some in in um, Alabama. Right. Uh, and there will be some here. Uh, but th- there's a difference between Space Force and Space Combatant Command or Space Command. Right. One fights the wars. The Space Force organizes, trains, and equips and makes sure that there are plenty of assets available, mm-hmm. just like the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Correct. Do. They don't fight the wars. Their, their combatant commands do. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, again, so many moving parts. Always. You know, we're, we're putting up a whole con- uh, constellation, they call it. 
you know, a thousand satellites out of the 10,000 planned for Starlink, you know, the SpaceX uh, missions that, they, that have been going on. We've been seeing Falcon 9s going up. It's been so exciting. I mean, the boosters are landing, you know, on these uh, these drone barges or, or, you know, right here at the, at the launch pad itself. It's been incredible to watch everything going on. And as a space enthusiast, I just can't wait to see what's around the corner. Like, I mean, I really... I really can't wait. Having having said that, with everything that has been going on just of late, let's let's say the last ten, mm-hmm. 10 years, uh, you've been with the Space Florida for now since two thousand nine, going on twelve years. Uh, in those twelve years, which I mean, there's so much to go. I mean, go over. I mean, it was the ending of the shuttle program. I mean, there was like right. I mean, and then there was kind of that meek area where you know maybe there wasn't so much funding anymore uh then there was uh this re- renaissance of private industry take us through maybe for the listener the last 12 years of of uh you at space florida well i i think that i did take over at a time when that was not real the outlook wasn't real bright right we we're facing the retirement of the shuttle there pretty dismal yeah nine thousand one hundred and thirty five jobs i think by count wow of direct space jobs that were lost Mm -hmm. and in partnership with other entities the edc the state enterprise florida the governor's office we realized that uh, this was the third time in florida's history Mm -hmm. where our industry had been maimed by an over dependence on a large federal program that got canceled so we committed to a strategy that Mm -hmm. really was aimed at diversification Right. of the industry and embarked on that. And I had a lot of support from the governor's office and from the legislature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we set out to put the right tools in place to achieve uh, a rebuilding of the industry and particularly the infrastructure that they need to thrive. So Space Florida doesn't give money away. Mm-hmm. We invest it primarily in infrastructure. And from the time I took over, Mm. I think our portfolio value of infrastructure was in the tens of millions. Is that right? Wow. And we ended the decade, uh, 2020, mm. at just over $2 billion. Oh, wow. So during that time, mm-hmm. we built a lot of infrastructure for space companies. They were everything from launch pads to uh, space processing facilities, took some of those facilities that were aged from NASA under mm. a cooperative agreement with NASA of some type right. and uh, modernized them for industry to use. Mm. We built facilities for companies like Embraer or Northrop mm. Grumman. We're, yeah. we're doing that now all over the state. Okay. But the, the, uh, the trick is to attract these companies into new infrastructure, modernized infrastructure, uh, or help them expand and grow here in Florida. That takes capital mm-hmm. and of that two billion i would say 94 percent of that was private sector capital not state money not federal money not taxpayer dollars that 94 percent is all from the private sector wow uh banks financial institutions mm-hmm. pension funds and uh, we attract it mm-hmm. with the with the quality of the deal curious because the uh the website is spaceflorida.gov yes so what capacity or what, what branch of the government is Space Florida associated with? We are um, a legislatively created oh. entity. Gotcha. So okay. our, our charter comes from statute. I but see. We're I created see. as a public corporation for the common good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, in many respects, we have all the attributes of a public or almost private corporation because mm-hmm. we operate like an an investment banking entity. Okay. Uh, But we're also made an independent special district Mm -hmm. so that we have, uh, we're a body politic, we have governmental authority, uh, Mm -hmm. just like any county or city or airport authority. Right. Except that we don't have the right of eminent domain. Oh, I see. So, uh, but we can pretty much function as a government, which allows us to be, to do a deal government to government at one level and then turn around and do a corporate deal at another level. And that gives us some pretty uh, interesting and powerful financing tools. It seems like a triple hybrid. It's like the benefits of a nonprofit and a church and a for profit. <laughs> it's like, you know, because they all have their 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 benefits, you know, and, and to and to create a um, 
a hybrid of of a couple different ideas it sounds like that's what it is and we are we are clearly a hybrid mm, there's right. no question uh, having both the for-profit public corporation right. status and the independent special district status gives us the ability to apply a lot of tools yeah, primarily so. to be able to float bonds and access private capital to build spaceport or right, or right. industry infrastructure speaking of that so so now you know, it's, it sounds like you've done incredible with, uh, you know, creating more and more assets. What's an asset that you're kind of considering now? I mean, is is the 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 runway or anything else? I mean, you know, are there are there assets that you're you're considering or or some that need, um, I don't know, to be abandoned, like the, maybe the runway? We know I don't know if we'll ever have a vehicle that needs, you know, six miles of runway or whatever it is uh, out there. You know, and and of course there's there is that all that facility. You know, you have a lighthouse out there. You have um, tons of storage for the different uh, byproducts from the launches and also the fuels and everything else you need, liquid oxygens. And, you know, you have all these assets out there. Um, what would make Space Florida better? What, 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 does, what do these private industries need more? Do they need more uh, fuel containers? Do they need more barges picking up drone, uh, you know, ships or, or, or more rockets, uh, you know, coming down? It just, it just seems like there's so much so many you know as i say plates on sticks are, are, are you know i mean there's just a juggling act of different things to manage and it's, it's happening quickly you know we got cargo into the port canaveral now you know so there's there's that other animal you have a uh you have a navy base there you have you know so you have all these different entities in in, in that vicinity and not only do, do they have to play ball together i'm sure there's some competing for that for that land you know the, the the canaveral seashore is only so big right so um, to summarize, what what is what's the next five years? What's what's what assets do you th- do you you see yourselves in being involved in? Well, we have uh, in addition to the charter under statute to grow the aerospace industry in the state. Okay, and that's statewide. Right, and we are working with a lot of projects statewide. We also have the responsibility to serve as the state's spaceport authority to mm-hmm. define the infrastructure and capabilities necessary to meet, uh, I'll call it client needs or stakeholder okay. needs, but it's, and that includes uh, all of the commercial companies, certainly, mm-hmm. but it may also be uh, in partnership with NASA or in partnership with the Air Force. Roger, We're okay. never going to do their job. Uh, NASA mm-hmm. does what it does in the Air Force right. as the national security mission, but there are things that are common use that we may be able to support. So as part of our look to the future, we do a uh, a spaceport outlook oh. plan that defines okay. what's needed to meet uh, the future needs. And that could include everything from commodities to power grid to roads and bridges mm. to uh, landing pads or launch pads. And so an example of that is we are right now putting in a utility corridor in the old former shuttle landing facility, which oh. we now call a space launch and landing facility. No kidding. And okay. we're preparing for a number of next generation corporations uh, that will be uh, either taking off vertically and landing horizontally or taking off horizontally and landing horizontally. Um, and uh, there are next generation spacecraft that will be winged that will cooperate. So that's <sighs> just one example. Yeah, and, and that's a great example because I, I see – and I'm not sure if it's news yet or if it's breaking news or whatnot, but I know uh, a uh, Sir Branson um, has this thing called the uh, Virgin Galactic. Yes. Uh, suborbital tourism. You know, you, you, you go up just to get weightless. You hang out for, you know, a few minutes, and then you come back down and you, and you descend in, in a low-orbit-style craft, you know, and um, and I think it's... I, I forget if the, I think there's still prototypes going on. They're still trying to figure out if it's going to be something that's uh, 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 appended to a a rocket and then goes off further and and jettisons out into the orbit. Or I'm you know I'm not sure what you heard, but I'm, well, I'm so curious. That particular uh, hmm. uh, commercial venture is almost ready to take off. It is it's, uh, okay. It's uh, in test flight mode now. It's the spacecraft number two, spaceship number two, but. Mm-hmm. It's carried up in a mothership right? Okay. to a certain level, and then it's dropped, and it goes into uh, the edge of space, and then 
comes back down and lands, mm -hmm. and it'll land horizontally. Uh, but they're not the only ones, and they oh, are, right. okay. they already have some, and I think it's in the 600 um, uh, tickets that were purchased yeah. for flight. In like the quarter million price tag or something? I, I wouldn't doubt that it's in that, yeah. in that range. <laughs> But there are others that are looking at the same mm -hmm. thing uh, right. in different forms. Sierra Nevada Corporation has a winged vehicle that will take off vertically, mm -hmm. uh, and it has a contract with NASA to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. Wow. And after it departs, it'll come down and it'll land on the uh, shuttle landing facility, former shuttle landing facility, mm -hmm. our space launch and landing facility, or it'll, it'll land in some other location. Uh, there is a company that is looking to operate here that will take passengers up in a, uh, a first class platform oh. uh, by balloon that goes oh, up to, really? to space. There are uh, a myriad of other mm -hmm. payloads being built to take tourists or uh, civilians mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to orbit. Right. And that, that includes SpaceX and Blue Origin. So there are multiple ways that uh, space is being democratized, mm -hmm. and uh, it starts with driving down the cost of space. Right. So to, to get back to your question just for a moment about mm -hmm. what are we seeing in the future, right. we're trying to build the capacity and capability at the spaceport to be able to handle 100 launches a year. Wow. As well as uh, to create, so it's a launch on demand capability as well mm -hmm. as a satellite on demand capability. So we want, if uh, someone has a requirement like a space combatant command, right. says we need a satellite on orbit tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, mm -hmm. and it's the day before, we can still pull the material together, integrate it, put it on a launch vehicle, and get it up there to reconstitute a lost asset. That's what we see the future of this area being, that kind of launch on demand and satellite on demand but satellite on demand these are these are new terms yes. I'm like, they, i mean it sounds exciting frank well it's it's how we have to prepare the infrastructure to mm -hmm. be able, and the industry right to be able to support what tomorrow's needs might be when when do you think it's enough is going to be enough meaning there's a lot of skeptics who admit that there's so much space junk like it's just a matter of time before one of these vehicles intersects with a satellite and you know it's going to be chaos or in in confusion and you know it's just going to be a disaster waiting to happen do you think there's too much space junk or, or you know i mean how much room is up there i don't know i'm sure we said the same thing about the oceans at one time and the mm -hmm. number of boats that were proliferating right <laughs> uh there there clearly is a lot of space junk mm -hmm. uh but there's also a lot of space right and i don't doubt that we're going to get better at finding ways to remediate some of the space junk that's up there, take trash out, right. and avoid creating more. Right. Uh, but the reality is there's uh, maybe never enough because more and more people will be going into space and mm -hmm. learn how to manage traffic just like we do on the ground. How yeah. many cars are enough? It's y to make sure you have the... Well, like, like the Jetsons, you know? I mean, these are these are all fantasies we've grown up with. You know, is it's, there's the, the, excuse me, the ground floor living mm -hmm. so to speak right and then you have the uh the next atmosphere whatever that looks like you know you have atmospheres you know going into water and i suppose you know at a thousand feet you know that would be like the tippy top of some of our modern skyscrapers you know so you just imagine people hopping from skyscraper to skyscraper you know and more more there's a uh, urban density and that's and you know cities continue to go vertically uh you know there may be a demand for that but i think uh all of it's just just pretty exciting you know people being able to go up and you know maybe a little exciting if you see a satellite you know just whizzing right by the size of a sofa you know well, and <laughs> what, what will make it work is the right. very same thing that makes it work here on the ground is mm -hmm. more and more aircraft are flying right it's situational awareness sensors for situational awareness right. and rules of the road mm -hmm. so that you know what to do when you're on a road and traffic's coming at you or you come to an intersection yeah it's knowing what the rules of the road are and how to operate in yeah. the increasingly uh, more dense environment with spacecraft. Well, you know, it's there's only already so many up there right now. So wouldn't it be horrible to map 
the constellations. I mean, it's it, you know they're going to give us their GPS coordinates. So it's right. almost like you you know you take their coordinates, you triangulate them, put them on a grid of some sort. You know, almost like a a, a second uh, atmosphere. You know, and 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 it's just it's like a digital, it almost looks like a Tron or a video game, right? I mean, it's just a a big grid, and and you could isolate each ones and and their continued path and much like directing traffic you know if, if if like you said we could do it at airports you know where these guys are managing you know, multiple planes arriving and departing at the same time it's going to be something similar and i'm sure that's just another category of of uh industry we'll have to we'll have to see you know yeah. celestial uh parking or celestial <laughs> in in many traffic respects management. there'll be new mm-hmm. services that open up right and there are already websites that are mm-hmm. available that will show you all the satellites that are up there, both alive and dead. Oh. Uh, and See, different orbits. Uh, the, all that stuff exists. I'm sure. The, yeah. uh, uh, there are groups, uh, uh, governmental groups, that keep track of space particles down to a certain size. Wow. So that we can steer uh, precious uh, platforms away from them. Well, certainly. Danger. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, that kind of mm. capability exists, and it's just going to have to get more refined as we put more and more useful mm-hmm. uh, platforms in orbit. So you heard it here first. Let's go into business. Find us, find, find, find us some money. Uh, but but we should launch a big magnet and just start collecting all the debris and just clean up the atmosphere, much like you know a street sweeper or anybody else, right? We'll just be the sky sweeper. There, I at least that I know of right now, mm-hmm. there are five, maybe six companies that are already planning to do that. Is that, that right? And See it's that? Not, not necessarily with a magnet, but... Right, well, but so it's... A, some they have a, a technology for taking uh, debris out of orbit. That's fascinating. See, I, 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 could, I could think of it today, but it's it's already been, you know, uh, duplicated and, and uh, beta tested, and uh, that's great, because there needs to be that function. I mean, I, I you know, I would tease SpaceX... Uh, when they first got the ISS contract, you know, I'm like, okay, so you're just the delivery boy, you know, essentially, you know, you you take some takeout, you take the trash, (laughs) you know, you're, you're really just like a sanitation, you know, you're, uh, much like waste management of space or something, you know? So I, I kind of find that, that funny, but it does need to happen. I mean, you know, there's producing waste up there. It has nowhere else to go. Right. We just want to continue, uh, um, uh, littering, you know, this, this new, uh, frontier, so to speak, and you've you've always been a frontier kind of guy. Um, how does it feel to be leading Space Florida? Uh, did you ever think, as a kid in Philly, this this is be a reality right now? No, I don't know that any of us ever see a clear vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people know they want to be an astronaut or a right. pilot, uh, but we often all take the road less traveled. Right, uh, and there's a way to evolve what you're doing decide what you're good at and right. observe your strengths and build on them. Mm-hmm. But uh, I have to admit, today I consider myself very lucky. I've got the coolest job <laughs> in, in my mind in the state, and I love what I'm doing, so it's really It sounds cool. fantastic. What, what do you think your your 12-year-old version of you would say if if, uh, if you were able to speak to him? At uh, 12 years old, I was I had a shoe shine stand. Is that I right? Did. Uh, and I was not all that good at it, and there were a bunch of pros all around the, sure. the area, but I learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I probably had a m- number of jobs after that that I learned from everything mm-hmm. from working in a Dairy Queen, which uh, an uncle yeah. owned, to a grocery store, to uh, done all of it myself. Yeah, being a bartender and a waiter at a at a country club. Mm-hmm. So you learn about people, and I think all of those things as you look at that, mm-hmm. uh, you still use those skills today. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, so, no, so in in less than words, I'm sure he'd be proud. He'd be su- super, just joy- joyful. From you know, probably grinning from ear to ear, seeing where you ended up. Well, uh, no, yeah. you didn't have to scoop another ice cream again. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, clearly right. we're we're happy with what we're doing. But I can tell you that mm. the biggest thing that I learned early on, and this is true with. KPMG time, all mm-hmm. the stuff that I did with the Pentagon, and, and uh, even when I had the venture firm mm-hmm. following my, my time with KPMG, uh, it takes a team to do it. Right. And that's not just a, a magnanimous comment on my part. Mm-hmm. Uh, today I have a group of people working with me at Space Florida that are really good right. at what we do, and that's 
listening and then being innovative in coming up with a financing structure that makes a deal work because we're financing things that are unusual. Right. Uh, banks don't line up to finance launch pads. It's got to be a hard so. ask it's to it, say a billion dollar payload is going to go up in a billion dollar rocket and I need it from you. <laughs> well, it's, it's all about yeah. managing risk and finding mm-hmm. ways to do that. And that's really where the art form right. is. Would you say you're a risk artist? Are you a master at we're, the uh, management? I, th- I think that we're we're good at risk management, mm-hmm. uh, learning to be, become a better artist. But that's right. that's really what it takes, and building confidence, doing the right things early on, so that you're not making frivolous investments. When we take a deal now to the marketplace, mm-hmm. they know that we've done due diligence and it's pretty thoroughly thought out. We don't take things to them frivolously. And that's right. important too. You're, well, you're the authority. We're, you know, we're, so you got to to establish that. Yes, exactly. So people are coming to you for that very objective, very highly computed, highly risk assessed. You know, uh, you know analysis. Yes. And uh, if you can be that person and help the financial institutions make the right choices, help uh, even uh, private investors. Uh, private companies, private enterprises, you know, come together and be like, well, it sounds like what Frank needs is somebody to clean up the orbit. So let, let's let's do what needs to be done. He's, he found money for it. Okay, great. You know, let's let's get a proof of concept. Let's see what if you know what it'll work. Let's get a prototype up there. See if it you know see if it'll work. Um, so all that does take a lot of money and and material and time and it's just it's it must be hard and and uh, exciting at both ends because you know there's some pitches that no bank's going to look at no private industry is going to take advantage of uh but there are some that's maybe it makes more sense you know if you told somebody that the uh, mine uh, an asteroid moving so many light years past earth every so often and they have to go get it to, to secure a trillion uh dollars worth of diamonds or whatever i heard is out there you know just like oh there's a Fifty trillion dollar asteroid out there. You know, if we could only capture it, we could solve all world's problems, right? Uh, and then there's the moon, which have obviously has no atmosphere, um, and it just looks like a a rock. You know, there's not much to it. You know, no water, no minerals. It's just a bunch of gray matter. It seems, right? The moon, um, Mars. We don't know yet. Still, you know, uh, lots of lots of uh, questions um, that are uh, that need to be answered regarding that opportunity where what would you be doing if you weren't with space florida now what do you where, would you be retired a, a different industry doing more accounting more venture capitalists uh i i enjoy the mm-hmm. investment art right uh, but i'd probably be on a sailboat nice somewhere. good answer uh, good answer. hopefully in the caribbean what kind of boat uh i'd love to have a uh, oh i don't know a nice it doesn't need to be huge but a 36 mm-hmm. footer that's a uh, ocean going uh, yeah it's the so something that one person can handle uh yeah i like that but yeah. uh, it's nice to have a crew uh amel check out the amel okay. uh group of boats i would love to see myself in the same same category maybe, maybe both of us i have a friend down in uh granada mm-hmm. he's been in granada like all summer he loves it won't come back and that's all he has. He has a you know, little boat. He manages it himself. It's it's easy to sail with one person. Um, that's a good answer. So so if you weren't you if you weren't living this dream, you you'd be in the Caribbean sailing around. That's something I thought about doing. I yeah. love I have seven grandkids, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time with them. But that's perfect. That's the, a, uh, that's the, a good crew. The, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the idea of being on a mm-hmm. sailboat or being able to sail even if you're just doing it offshore. Right time it on the water that is just uh, peaceful and that uh, restores you i think i had a i had a sailboat at one time that was mm-hmm. a nice size one. i think uh frank you, you have a similar spirit like mine you know um forever that uh that seeker of something new you know some trying to get that nostalgia of what it must be like pioneering something you know when you're on a boat you actually feel like that you know it's just you and the water and you know, shorelines surround you. You know, in all directions. You know, what? You know, where are you going to point that bow, and and uh, where's that wind going to come from, and, and push you along? You know, 
Uh, but it's a very, very romantic idea. You know, I think Jimmy Buffett um, mentioned it yet. You know, um, a sailor at 40 or, or, or some similar title. But yes, I am a pirate 400 years too late. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, something romantic about that lifestyle where, you know, you were potentially finding new shores. You know, you were bearing treasure on on uh unmapped islands you know just nothing you know a lot of uncharted stuff territory just just waiting to be yours you know i i i find that to be romantic and and fun and well, it is romantic it is fun um, right. but the lesson in life is to learn to um uh, learn to gain knowledge from the mm-hmm. failures you make you try something and you don't make it Mm -hmm. You don't quit. You get back up and you figure out what went wrong and you move on. And that only helps you, not only helps you innovate, but it helps you try something. When I left KPMG, which was Mm -hmm. a very staid conservative, and I had the practice humming, I had been there 24 years. Right. uh, And they're still there today. uh, They're they're still there doing very, very well. Um, I left to start a venture capital company, Mm -hmm. which is like the wild, wild west. Right. We were creating a venture capital company to go invest in companies that were taking defense and space technology to large commercial market. Roger. At a time when right. there weren't many investors in space, period. Uh, and we did raise $300 million and we did start to deploy it mm-hmm. in a variety of companies. Uh, but we had some wins and we had some kicks in the teeth. You just need to learn from all of those and <laughs> yeah. make it make it happen. Would you like to illustrate on the biggest lesson learned, or most expensive lesson learned? Oh, the most expensive mm-hmm. was clearly clearly that one. Uh, I think don't get greedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, know what your objectives are, and right. when you reach them, uh, reach for that and allow yourself to build on that. Don't uh, don't get greedy. But I think also to trust your people. Right. That's in life. I think that's uh, to work with a team and trust your people. Grow the kind of environment where you mm-hmm. build that in your team. And that's a big, big part of success. Yeah, and and much like um, being a captain of a boat, mm-hmm. you know, you have to have that tight ship. You know, and that's that's actually uh, not just a cliche. You know, um, when you're out there, maritime law, uh, it's really you and the people you're surrounding yourself on this little vessel. Because when you're there and and you're in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific or any great body of water, you know, what looks like a big boat from shore, you know, a 100-footer, 200-footer, maybe a cruise ship. You put it out there in the middle of the ocean, it's a speck. Absolutely. And it's literally those souls that, that are with you that may or may not perish together, right? You all take that risk. Um, and And you count on those people. And much like a much like a ship, where you know one little uh, idea may go wrong, you know, i.e., t- Titanic and, and other you know mis- misfortunes out there in the great sea, um, you know, you you got to make sure that that your team is capable and and that that and more more importantly that they have confidence in you as a leader, and so you have to make sure that not only do you know how to complete all their roles, and if you had to step in to complete it or help out or whatever else. Uh, but you also have to identify where maybe, you know, someone's uh, not so strong. So you got to send another teammate over there to help them. And, and, you know, so it's a lot of, you know, trying to, to not micromanage, but, you know, do that mic- macro managing from that, that, that more 30,000 foot view, as they like to say. And uh, yeah, make sure that you just, you just keep the, the bottom wet and the, the top side dry <laughs> and you'll be okay. Well, it's, preparing mm-hmm. and then in being able to anticipate the unknowns and to be able to deal with unknowns and right. that in a sense well it's whether it's sailing mm-hmm. from destination a to destination b right. i went from annapolis to nantucket and oh beautiful I, I can tell you that that is similar to space travel mm-hmm. it's similar to exploration right we can study the environment that we're going out into mm-hmm. and we can anticipate but we also have to be able to deal with unknowns right. and to do the best we can to prepare for that. Absolutely. Well, very wise words. Um, Frank, 
not to keep you, but you're a busy man. It's been an hour of your time. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Absolute pleasure. Myself, Absolute yeah. Pleasure. So uh, for all of our listeners, this has been another uh, Business Elite Brevard Edition episode. Uh, once again, I am Jesse Hall, and I am your host. And we hope you got a lot out of this conversation. Of course, uh, if you're listening to it after the fact, continue to, to share the word, uh, ask questions, comment, reach out to us. We'd love to see what your feedback is regarding this episode. Uh, for all of you listening, go ahead and, and hit that subscribe or follow button wherever you listen to podcasts. And until next time, may your business be great. Take care.